You don't find out how much people hate Jesus? Bring him up in a conversation at work or at school. And they will hate you because of him. They don't have any reason to hate him. What do you ever do to anybody? Seriously, what do you ever do to anybody? He didn't ever do anything to someone. He never hurt anybody. But the world does hate him. They don't have any reason to hate him, but they do. Did you look at my notes? <laughs> I have written type right here. They do so because they are led by the devil. He's the ruler of this world today. He who is and who was, the Bible says. God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. He's always reigned. Now, it, you know, as you look around, you see all the horrible things that go on. It might look like Satan's in the driver's seat today. But always remember this. And if you need a reminder of this, just open your Bible sometime and read the book of Job. Satan is not allowed to do anything unless God lets him. God has his hand on the ring, okay? He even had to go to God, Satan had to go to God and ask permission to attack Job. And God said, yes, you can do that. However, these are the limits I'm placing on you. Satan is under God's authority. Okay? Remember, Satan was created. God was never created. Jesus was never created. The Holy Spirit was never created. Satan and all the angels were created by God. Okay? 17th verse, God is called Almighty. Taking your great power and begun to reign. Like I said, every human kingdom eventually falls or fails because it's built on limited power of humans. But God's kingdom was established by the one who holds all power. He'll never be overcome by the enemy. Now there's a verb phrase in here for those of you. How many uh, people love to study Greek? That's what I thought. But I have to tell you, I have to explain this to you, okay? The verb phrase in here is in Greek is called proleptic heirs. And this is what it means. It should describe future events that are so certain they can be talked about as if they already happened. Okay? For example, my son has my car. He has it out past midnight. I could, could have said to him as if it already happened, I brought you in the world. I'll take you up. Right? Like Bill Cosby. Exactly right. Okay? So this tense is used to describe it. It's the same thing that's used in Isaiah 53, who wrote about Jesus' suffering and crucifixion in the future, but as if it already had happened. In other words, it's a prediction that is so certain that it's going to happen, they write it as if it already did. Okay? That's what is going on here in Revelation 11. Verse 18. The nations were angry. Your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants and prophets and your people who revere your name, both great and small, for destroying those who destroy the earth. Like I said, the world hates Jesus. And it would demonstrate that hatred towards him when he comes to reign. This verse is looking ahead to that day when the armies of the world will gather themselves together to fight against him. The hatred of Christ is everywhere you look today. Look at how that, even in our own country, they're trying to eradicate the name of Jesus from everything. This is reminiscent of Psalm 2, and I need to read this to you. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's anybody who's a Christian. Saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The ones enthroned in heaven last, the Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I've installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've become your father. Ask me and I will make nations your inheritance. The ends of the earth your possession. You'll break them with a rod of iron. You'll dash them to pieces like pottery. In Psalm 2, verses 1 to 9, we see that they'll rise up against the Lord. They'll attempt to conquer him, but God has the final say. And while lost sinners face the Lord in judgment, people who believe him will be honored for their devotion to him. I've said this in a few sermons before this. I want to keep repeating it because it bears repeating. Every act of devotion to God is noted by him. He notices. He's paying attention. And it will be rewarded. 
Nothing so small will be missed. In fact, Jesus even said, a cup of cold water given in my name. He notices everything we do for him. Every deed done in his name. And he will reward us. Verse 19. God's temple in heaven was opened within his temple with the ark of his covenant. There came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. An earthquake and a severe hailstorm. Now this almost seemed out of place here in this chapter. It really doesn't seem to fit in with the rejoicing that's going on in heaven. But it's important to mention. There are two great realities, because the temple's going to be back in place on Jewish ground, okay? And it talks about access. The open temple and the vision of the ark remind us that in heaven we'll have access to the Lord. You know, the Bible says now, nobody can look on the face of God and live. Then you will be able to look on His face. All right? There won't be anything to separate us from Him. Then there's affirmation. The mention of the ark puts us squarely on Jewish ground. You see, the ark of the covenant for the Jew represented the presence of God. Okay, that's where he was. And it's reminding the Jews that God isn't finished with them. He'll complete his plan for Israel. Now, in the Bible, there are five different names for the ark. In Numbers 10.33, it's called the ark of the covenant because it contains the law. Okay? The Ark of Testimony is what it's called in Exodus 25 because it testified to God's holiness and our sinfulness. God's still holy. He hasn't changed, and we're still sinners. It's called the Ark of God in 1 Samuel 3, 3, and it was the only visible throne of God on earth. It reminds us that God is on His throne. In Psalm 132, 8, it's called the Ark of Strength, and it's called that because of the miracles and great works associated with it. God is still mighty. And in 2 Chronicles 35, 3, it's called the Holy Ark. And it was called that because it was where God dwelt. And reminds us that he's still alive and well. So verse 19 closes with premonitions of impending disasters, worse horrors than those we've seen thus far. Great. We've seen things from God's perspective. Now we're going to look at them from the devil's perspective. Starting with Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. The second half opens with an amazing vision of some great wonders in heaven. I'll tell you what, I'm looking at the clock, I'm thinking of how far we have to drive, and I'm thinking I don't want to go too far into chapter 12, because I might not find a good place to stop. So what do you say I stop here? Yeah. All, all in favor say aye. Okay, all right. So we start, we start with chapter 12. I'll find that out before next week. Nick's, please stand. Nick's going to pray. I like the first part of uh, when we read chapter 12, uh, referring to how the kingdoms of this world, well, the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our God, Jesus Christ. I love that. The meek will inherit the earth. This is ours for the taking. We just got to wait on God. The name Jesus means God saves. We wait for his redemption. But until then, we have a redemption in our heart. Let's joy, rejoice in that. Let's pray. Thank you so much for what you gave us in your son, Jesus Christ. Our king, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the fact that you are going to inherit and you are going to get, share with us the earth, which is yours for the taking. And that those who destroy the earth will be taken care of in judgment. And that our enemies will eventually bow down and worship you because they will have to. But we thank you and we worship you, showing the world what it means to worship the one true God. In Jesus' name, we love you. Amen. Amen.